Thanks, Mike, for the prayer. I appreciate that. Thank you, Renee, for the scripture reading. Thank you for the music this morning. I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to singing again. Anybody else? And, and I confess, I might sing a little quiet in my mask. I know some of y'all are doing that. And, and thank you, Danae, for the children's story. And with the question, when have you felt God's love? That's a relevant question. In our families, when have you felt, when do you feel God's love? To think about that and to talk about that together, I think uh, that's delightful. So the first slide I have this morning, oh, look at that. I promised a baby picture. Yasha Naomi Delp um, took the picture when we went to visit and we had a good picture. And so I'm thinking about a call and response again. I'm going to call out. Who are we? And and though it may be a little cumbersome, I'd like you to respond. We are the children of God. Who are we? We are the children of God. Who are we? We are the children of God. One more time, like you mean it. Who are we? We are the children of God. We are. The children of God. And I believe one of the reasons you do repetitions with call and response or in other church traditions, you, you repeat things over and over and over. You know why that is? It's so you get it. And so that it goes deep. And so it's not just, we are the children of God. And we take it for granted. Because the reality is, we need to know that we are loved. Life relationships, voices so easily pull away from this truth that we are the beloved children of God. A couple of scriptures I'm going to share with this morning that, that go with this. John 1, 12. But to all who received him, all who received Jesus, allowed Jesus to be part of their life, who believe in his name, God gave power to become, and here's the key, children of God. God has given us the opportunity to be children of God. Romans 8, 16 reads, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit, with our inside, that we are children of God. Who are we? Caught some of you distracted already. Stay with me, church. You know? And, and online, at home, it's sometimes hard to pay attention. But thank you for staying with it. I'm going to invite you, beloved children of God, would you stand And would you greet each other with a hand wave or make some eye contact, acknowledge. And don't forget our brothers and sisters who are live streaming in. They could use a wave, a hello, because they are beloved children of God as well. It's good. So two weeks ago, I named um, that we are called to not just do our own thing. Followers of Christ are not just called to do whatever you want to do. Followers of Christ are called to make sacrifices. Jesus used the word, take up your cross and follow me. That would infer some sacrifice, right? Taking up your cross. Imagine carrying this. That's a burden. That's a sacrifice, right? So are we called to make sacrifices so that we look pious? No. Are we called to make, py- are we called to make sacrifice so we can feel proud of ourselves that we're doing all these good works? What do you think? 
No, it's not for that. It's the next slide. We are called to make sacrifices in following Jesus so more people may know God's love. So as promised, a little family pick here. You see my daughter Grace, son-in-law Ben, and the four little ones, and baby Yasha right there in the front. This just illustrates for me that following Jesus isn't just for me. It's for more people. If I don't make sacrifices, how do I expect my daughter or my son-in-law or my grandchildren or others around us to know about God's great love? Church, we and others need to know, we need to know over and over how much we are loved by God. And this isn't just sweet, syrupy words. Oh, God loves you. It's a deep reality when you face a struggle, a wilderness, a desert, a darkness. You need to know that you have value and purpose. Can a brother get an amen? Amen. So just a reminder here, we may be limited in our singing, but we're not limited in being able to say amen or brother, I'm with you or I'm listening or hmm, I'm really listening, right? And sometimes saying amen helps you stay engaged when, when you're thinking about, wow, I lost an hour of sleep or it's raining outside and this has been a good morning just to stay home, right? Church, if we don't guard and protect the truth that we are beloved children of God, that we are loved deeply by God, life circumstances will steal that truth from you, or the evil one will gladly take that reality from you. The evil one will gladly make your mind foggy so that you feel like a nothing. Has anyone ever felt insignificant or like you don't matter? thinking we have to guard and protect the truth that we are loved by God so having some baby holding time we would all agree right that newborn babies little older baby toddlers the reason they need to be held is because they need to know that they are what loved it's a core thing And as we age, we need to find some other creative ways that we can say love to those around us. Who of us doesn't need a pat on the back, a half hug, or a full hug from an important person in our lives to say, I love you? Or who of us have had our face held in someone's hands and they say, I love you? And that's strong and meaningful. I also think it's huge to be able to image Jesus putting his hands out like this for you and me, holding our faces, looking at us eye to eye and saying, you matter to me. I love you. Then we can face the wilderness, the struggles, the mysteries, the pain of life. But we have to do our part. We have to protect. So the next slide I have this morning, desert or wilderness times will confront all of us. Amen? Does anybody disagree with that statement? Okay. You realize what you just agreed with? We're going to have pain and struggle. So part of today's message is how will you respond? in the deserts and wildernesses of life. So the people of Israel, they had experienced God in a deep and real way, being delivered powerfully from slavery and being led away from Egypt. But they soon become antsy, irritable, complaining as their wilderness faced them. Even, even after they were delivered from privileged Egypt, 
who was abusing them because slavery is a form of abuse. Amen? But they took it for granted so soon. Listen, in Numbers, and if you want to turn to Numbers 20, follow along. Listen to some of the things that developed with these Israelites who had been delivered from slavery, delivered from being killed and abused. Numbers 20, verse 2. Now, there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. We're thirsty. Mommy, we're out of soda. You know, they're fussing and moaning about this. They're forgetting that, man, they couldn't get a drink whenever they want when they were in slavery. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place. It has no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Boo hoo hoo, complainy, fussy, moany. I hate it when I'm that way. But we are, aren't we? We're really the people of Israel. We have so much true. Two, we've been delivered from so much, and yet what do we do? We fuss and complain. Numbers 21, verses 4 and 5 read, From Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. Anybody have gotten impatient in this past year. All right, thank you. So this is our story too. This isn't just another group that was immature. This is us, and it's okay to own it. Verse five in Numbers 21 reads, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Sometimes we've spoken against God, haven't we? The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. How do you like it when you cook? And someone says, we detest this miserable food. You're providing for someone, a family member maybe, and they say something negative about the food. I wonder how that would go in the Ray family. Hmm. Or any of our families, right? God provided for these Israelites, and here they're fussing and complaining about it. In the wilderness. Unfortunately, that's like us. Church, will you be a complainer? Or will you seek God? Will you quarrel and blame another? Or help find a solution when you inevitably have a desert or wilderness experience? Will you speak against God when the going gets tough and difficult. Will you? And Numbers 21 goes on and says, those who spoke against God and continued to speak against God and continue to speak against God, it didn't go well for them. And I'll let you look at that on your own. There's a little bit of Old Testament justice there that I'm not always comfortable with, but It can be a reality when we continue to speak against the one who loves and cares and provides for us. Desert or wilderness times will confront all of us. How will you respond and keep responding? Church, are you listening? Are you with me? You want me to speed up and finish or keep going? 
Is this good? So the next slide. Deserts and wildernesses, they confront our vulnerabilities. You see that with the Israelites. It confronted their vulnerabilities. COVID has confronted many of our vulnerabilities, right? Deserts and wilderness expose our wounds. Did that for the Israelites. And it's happened for us. And so sometimes we lash out at whoever or whatever we can lash out. That's what's happening in numbers. They're lashing out at Moses and Aaron. They're lashing out at God. We've done that. Wildernesses and deserts also announce our needs. It makes it really obvious. And sometimes it's painful and difficult. Deserts and wildernesses often don't bring out our best selves. It didn't, certainly, for the Israelites. But why are we so surprised when they come? Jesus himself said in John 16, 20, 16, 33, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have struggle. You will have wildernesses. Amen? But then Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome them. And I take that now as Jesus saying to us, I can help you overcome them as well. So I was thinking about deserts and wildernesses and times when I've been confronted with my vulnerabilities, my wounds, my needs. So I thought of a few. And I invite you to think about some of the wildernesses you've been through that God has given you healing through. It's good to remember those. It's good to share stories when we experience God's love with people around us. So I remember in high school, I went to a Mennonite high school, and I was getting a lot of religious Mennonite information, but it was just in my head. And there came a point for me, I needed to make a decision. Was I just gonna, was faith just gonna be intellectual for me, or was there gonna be a heart piece for me? That was a wilderness I faced, and I needed to make a decision. And I made a decision that I called out to Jesus for help. And I said, I want not only head knowledge, I want heart knowledge as well. I remember as a young teacher, teaching in the inner city at, at Anderson Elementary in Tulsa, Oklahoma, north side. And wrestling with my identity as a teacher and wanting to help and make a difference for young people. But realizing I had limits. The in the wilderness, you have limits. I had limits. I couldn't save and help all the people that I wanted to help. There's just so much brokenness. Then, in that space, but then the realization in the world. But I needed to get some help. Not to give up, and that's where the healing came up, but to realize, okay, so this peace is what God is calling me to do. And that was partly where the healing happened for me. I remember going to seminary, wrestling with this, this challenge of wanting to do more with my life and sensing a call to ministry, but how's it going to happen? I've got family to provide for or help provide for. And sensing God's call to do three years of seminary in midlife, even when I was ready, or so I thought, let's go in the pastorate and do this now. But the training was helpful in so many ways. And then after pastoring my first pastorate, seven years, and feeling like I have failed, when he recognized it was time to change, this wasn't working, the connection wasn't happening anymore. You ever been in a job in a situation you feel like a failure? That's a desert. That's a wilderness that God wants to bring healing and help for. And I am thankful for the healing and the things that I've said here. Because it's often when you're hit with the wilderness, it's easy to give up. Just to throw it all away. Blame God. Or blame the leaders. Or blame somebody else. Or 
or losing my wife, Naomi, the mother of my children, the grandmother of my children, and co-pastor. We pastored together for 15 years. That was a desert. And then the desert of, of leaving Ohio, starting new life here in Kansas and, and, and trying to figure things out. And then, oh yeah, COVID hits. Wow. So these are some of, some of my wildernesses that I've faced that exposed vulnerabilities and wounds, announced needs. And church... I name that I continue to have deserts and wildernesses. I love to say they just go away after a certain point. Sisters in the front, do they go away? No, the struggles, the wildernesses continue to happen. So we might as well learn how to face them, right? Let me talk about that from today's text. In the deep wildernesses of life, God calls us to experience deep healing. And it's not a one-time deal. But I've got to start somewhere. And you keep calling. And you keep calling for help. It's the next slide this morning. In the face of struggles and wildernesses, the Lord calls us to deep healing through love. It starts with love. He helps us through our wildernesses because he loves us plain and simple and he wants to help us. How will you respond? I love love. That's said in our household by a certain teenager. I love love, she says. That's wonderful. I love it. Love, love. You feel the love in my picture there hugging my grandson? I love that. And sometimes I need an image of love. When have I received God's love? Danae's question, that's an example for me. Being hugged full-heartedly from a family member. How will you respond? Let me share a couple verses from the text that Renee read for us this morning. John 3, 16. For God, the creator, so loved the world. That's you and me. For God so loved you and me that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that everyone, say that with me, Everyone, say it again, everyone who believes in Jesus may not die, but have what? Eternal life. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait until I die to experience that love. Do you? I want it now. Eternal life can start, should start, Right now. For God so loved us that God gave Jesus so that everyone who believes in Jesus can experience this deep life and love. In Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, Paul's writing, and Paul knew a thing about struggle himself. You don't think it was a wilderness for Paul when he thought he was doing the right religious thing, killing Christians, because he was a zealot. He was zealous for the law, for his religion. And then on the road to Damascus, boom, that bright light hit him. And and he heard Jesus' voice. And the voice said to him, what are you doing, man? You're persecuting me. And then... Saul, Paul, had some changes in his life, and he had to to face a lot of things. And you don't think that there was change and, and struggle inside of him? He writes this, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even 
when we were dead through our sin, made us alive with Christ. You can't out sin God's love. He's going to keep pursuing you. God's going to keep pursuing you because He loves you so much. It's by grace you have been saved. Will you say yes to love and healing? Will you embrace deeply God's love and grace? Not just in an intellectual, rational way, but in a heart way. Will you embrace that? God's love, God's help, God's healing has and continues to be there for, for me, for us. You know, there's plenty of pain in the world, right? And I remember a story, and some of you have heard me say it, that after my wife Naomi died, it was the worst thing that happened to my life at that time. And I remember sitting in a restaurant by myself eating and and hearing the spirit whisper, look around the restaurant. There's plenty of pain to go around, the spirit said. There's plenty of pain. Now, the spirit wasn't saying that to diminish my own pain, but it was just leveling the playing field so that I didn't just think my pain was the only pain there is. And if we think that, we're in trouble. Our pain isn't the only pain out there. Because if we're only thinking about our own pain, we can't help other people with their pain. But the Spirit was able to bring my pain back here and say, hey, notice other pain too. And then as we do that, we can help each other. So the phrase for me is there's plenty of pain to go around. But the flip side to that is there's plenty of of healing and love as well. There's not just plenty of pain in the world. There's plenty of healing and love in our world as well. And if we're tapped into that, we can help ease the pain that's in this world because there's plenty of healing and love as well. Two weeks ago, I also invited you to make a deeper commitment to the Lord. Some of you made a signal to the Lord and did that. Others didn't. I know through the years, I've had opportunities to respond to God, say, in a church setting, and I didn't. And sometimes I regretted it later. I also remember times when in a, in a worship service... I long for the pastor or the preacher to invite some kind of response. And that didn't happen. I also remember the time when I knew I needed to respond. And, and the invitation was to raise a hand. And, you know, it's not that big a deal to raise a hand unless you've had recent you know, shoulder replacement surgery, which I have not. And, and maybe some of you have. But I remember I knew I needed to respond. That's what the Spirit was stirring inside of me. But it seemed this motion was like trying to lift 50 pounds this way. You ever try to lift 50 pounds this way? Without cheating, you know. It was like, ah. Oh. Because sometimes when the Spirit is stirring us to make a response, it's really hard. And part of that challenge is, will we fight through the struggle to say, I want to say yes? I'm offering this to you this morning. To raise your hand and hold it up. If you want to say yes to Jesus and his love today. Raise your hand if you want to say yes to deep healing. Whether you are presently in a dry desert, in a deep wilderness right now or not. You're saying, I want to say yes to deep healing. I want to continue the process of that. I'm inviting you to raise your hand if you want help 
with your life from the Lord who loves us so much. So if that's you, if you want to say yes, I invite you to hold your hand up. Say, I want some help. I want some help with my life. I want to experience healing. I don't want to be the complainer. I don't want to blame everybody else. I want to be part of the solution. And so I invite you with this last slide. Give you a moment. To scan that, you can put your hands down and invite you with me to pray this prayer together. Let's pray together, and I invite everyone to pray. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, have mercy on me, a sinner. I want to experience your love and healing, Lord. Help me. Show me the next steps you want and need me to take. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's hold that for a moment, church. So as the worship persons come to leave in our response song, hear this scripture from Isaiah 54, verse 10. Even if the mountains heave up from their anchors and the hills quiver and shake, I, the Lord, will not desert you. The Lord says, you can rely on my enduring love. The Lord says to you and me, my covenant of peace will stand forever. That's something to be thankful for. That no matter what happens in this world, if things are falling apart, the promise of God's love enduring. God's love for us as individuals, that's worth praising. Amen? Amen. Bring on the healing river. invite you to stand.
Amen. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.